Welcome to the Strand, um, the 85-year-old independent bookstore of 18 miles of books. I'm Jessica Strand, and I'm the new events director here, and I'm not part of the founding family. So after the reading, it's, it's not that strand I'm related to. Um, it's actually Bass. Um, tonight I'm pleased to welcome Josh uh, Bazel with all his family and friends and everyone here with his new darkly funny thriller, Wild Thing, in conversation with journalist and author Malcolm Jones. Um, Josh Bazel burst onto the writing scene with his popular Beat the Reaper, and his bio made me feel like an underachiever, though there are other doctors who write novels. They seem to be in a special category a group of folks you can't help but be wildly impressed by. It's hard enough to write a novel, but to also be a doctor. Anyway, um, joining Bazell is journalist Malcolm Jones, a cultural critic at Newsweek and The Daily Beast. He also is the author of the memoir, Little Boy Blues. Um, tonight, they're going to talk here for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. And, um, and then Josh will sign copies of his book. So please join me in welcoming Josh Bazell and Malcolm Jones. Well, thank you all for coming. Today. You wanted to say first, right? Yeah, just briefly. Uh, this this bookstore, this brand, uh, is my favorite bookstore, and it has always been my favorite bookstore. Uh, I used to drag people here to make them find me books. <laughs> which is sort of an astonishing turn of events. And uh, a lot of people uh, in the room uh, helped me reach this point. I won't name everybody because I've required a lot of help over the years. Uh, but just a quick sampling. All four of my parents are here. All three of my siblings. Uh, Rebecca, Stephanie, Zach is here from Ankara in Turkey. Uh, I've got friends here from grade school, from residency, from every uh, ridiculous uh, step in between. Um, my uh, great agent, Marcus Hoffman, is here. Uh, my editor, Reagan Arthur, is here. Uh, Sam Zanger is here, who did the uh, end page illustrations, which I love. Uh, and uh, my fantastic publicist, uh, Sabrina Callahan, who uh, brought us here. Uh, today. There may, although it doesn't look like it, be uh, even somebody here who I don't know personally or who does not have a social obligation to be here. <laughs> it's kind of a dangerous question to ask because um, I recognize both guys who just came in. Um, so I actually forget that. I'm not going to ask. But I will say uh, thank you all very much for being here. I wondered what that was. Uh, oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. All right. Um, this is, yeah, okay. Well, my, my team didn't show up at all. So, uh, anyway, um, I have to ask you, if, uh, the first question I have to ask is, because it's been something I've been thinking about uh, every time I pick it up, is... Does the title for Beat the Reaper have anything to do with the Firesign Theater? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's not, uh, I, mean, I mean, I had, uh, I had heard it. I, I wasn't that, I don't think I remembered the skit, right. but I'm fairly certain I had heard it uh, in, I think I was about 12 when I was right. listening to them a lot. Uh, but it actually ended up fitting it quite nicely, yeah. I thought. Yeah, okay. I just wanted for to anybody who doesn't know, Beat the Reaper is a skit where it's a game show where you have to guess uh, what disease they've just given you within right. 60 seconds yes. or something, and, right. or else they won't cure you. Right. I'm turning yellow. I've, I've got, I've got, I've got jaundice. That's right. You know. Um, and then somebody dies of the plague. Um, so talk, if you, if you will, talk about just the character um, that you've created in, that, you know, walks through both these books. Yeah, I mean, it's a sort of... Uh, Expression. When I, I went to medical school, I was pretty old. Um, I think I was afraid it would remove my personality entirely. And I started thinking about a character who, whose personality wasn't erased at all by med school. Hmm. Uh, and that's really where this guy came from, who starts out as a mafia guy and uh, sort of tries to make up for that by becoming a doctor, but uh, has all kinds of problems doing that. Right. 
Now, I, and this is something I've always wondered, and you're only two books into this, obviously, but, and I assume that you will continue with this character um, in subsequent books. Um, yeah, I think as, as long as anybody's interested, plus two books. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, the, and, and the first book, obviously, is much more plot heavy in terms of explaining his story and what happened to him, et cetera. Um, does that ever get to be, I mean, was it in the second book, for example? I mean, did it, did it ever become like just a little bit of a burden that you had to like explain who this guy was or, you know, just the mechanics of it, I guess, I'm sort of interested in me. Like, what, what do you do with a series detective kind of, or, or, you know, a character? Yeah, that's astute, actually. I came up with the plot for the second one first. Um, and just sort of mentioned that he was a doctor who used to be a hitman. And it, was, it just didn't really fly. It, it seemed to require some kind of explanation. I was working up the backstory, and it just turned into a novel that I ended up publishing first. Right. Uh, I think uh, John Sanford it was who said, uh, when was the last time you heard somebody say that the 18th book in a series is their favorite? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I wrote the sequel with a lot of sequel awareness. Huh. Uh, trying to make it as unsequely in most respects as possible. Right. Um, did you, when you started doing this, I mean, did you, did you sort of sit down and just sort of study the way crime books are put together? Um, or was I, it just something that you already liked a lot and just thought, I want to try this? Yeah, I mean, I've been reading crime heavily since I was 10 or so, so yeah. it was uh, just one of those things. Um, well, as long as we're on the subject, though, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sort of consistently amazed at just people's interest in crime fiction. I mean, it, it's, mm. you know, it, it's sort of like, I, sometimes I feel like it's three quarters of the publishing business, at least in fiction right now. I mean, if you look at the bestseller list, that's what people buy. Um, and I'm sort of at a loss to explain that in some ways. Right, particularly as crime fiction has really sort of uh, taken two paths. Uh, one, the, the sort of original intent crime fiction that seeks to sort of shock you or make a social point. And uh, there's a lot of crime fiction which is more pastiche these days. Uh, you know, the Scandinavian detectives who right. listen to American blues and drink heavily and, and follow pattern killers. Uh, and I think that that latter option is sort of very familiar and comforting to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a fair amount of violence in these books, but you've seen those things before. Right. Uh, which, to me, is sort of the opposite of the noir ideal. Um, but, yeah. You know, I guess the other thing you could say about it is, uh, you know, we, in, the, in the era of the fraudulent prosperity of the Bush years, the two top-selling novels, obviously, were Harry Potter, and uh, Twilight, and it may be that that's part of this sort of ongoing uh, infantilization of society that, that Benjamin Barber talks about, but it may be that those were sort of a fantastical stretch of years uh, where people weren't very particularly rooted in reality. Um, so it'll be curious to see what, what happens with crime fiction going forward. Right. Well, I don't, I don't certainly read everything in crime fiction, but as far as I know, you may be the first person to write a crime novel that is also social criticism. Ooh, you think? I, I, and I, I'm sorry, I hate... I Certainly hate footnoted and an, an, an appendix, I would say. <laughs> um, is there no appendix in Treasure of the Sierra Madre? I don't think so. We're in the rare books room, we can find out. We could find out, uh, that's right. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's also, it's like what is... Cr most novels have crimes in them of True. some cor kind or other. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, I think there's been a, a fair number of, of social commentary. I mean, you know, the, the girl with the dragon tattoo is is a fairly angry book about yeah. right. numerous things. But, right. But politics seems to be one of them. Um, I think that it's become much rarer recently. Right. It's it's hard to tell reading something like dragon tattoo if you don't live in that country if if he's referring to something specific or not i mean right. you have to kind of assume there's something there that right. resembles reality in that country i mean um but exactly what it is it's kind of hard to say i uh, agree and um uh, you just said but you said something interesting i thought uh, there is i think 
in your books, particularly in the second one, there's, there is a lot of anger in that book, it seems to me, or you know, just sort of like you feel like your head is going to explode that kind of feeling. I think that's right in the sense that I seem to have been a lot angrier when I started than when I finished, hmm. and I think that must have ended up somewhere. Uh, it, <laughs> was it, so it was purgative for you? To, yeah, I feel yeah. great, thanks. Um, I, don't know, uh, I don't know what the effect is on anybody else. I would just mention one book, though, uh, The Axe by Donald Westlake, ah, okay. uh, which of course was, uh, I think it was 92, it was in the uh, sort of recession like of that times. So it's right. about a guy who can't get a job in his bizarre uh, specialized field, so he starts soliciting uh, resumes from people who have those skills and then killing them. And it's awesome. The axe, Westlake. We're, we're, we're in complete agreement on this, yes. Right on. If you only read one book this year, no. Right. <laughs> right. If you read two. Yeah. <laughs> if you only read one. Um, yes, yeah, poor Don. Um, where was I? Um, so, okay, does the character I think in the first book, the character kind of drives the plot. I mean, it's his circumstances. Right. Not so much, maybe, in the second right. book. Um, and I, I assume that because people are here for Josh, that most people here know something about these books. But do you want to take a couple of minutes and just sort of explain briefly what each book is about so that everybody sort of has an idea? I mean. Sure. I don't, I don't want to like mystify everybody here. I don't, I don't you know, I never know what people know. Uh, the first book is about a guy who becomes a killer for the mafia in what I hoped was possibly the most sympathetic spin you could give on that. Uh, I mean, it's never forgivable, but he is a young teenager and is living with his grandparents who get murdered and he gets very uh, sort of heavily manipulated into working for the mob. Uh, he uh, does eventually turn against them. Uh, and uh, goes into the witness protection program and, and ends up going to med school. And of course they find him. Uh, and that's sort of the plot of the first book. Uh, the second book, uh, it's interesting. To me it really seemed like a medical book because uh, it's really about rationality and the scientific method. Uh, it's less about actual medicine though. Right. Um, he gets uh, hired by this reclusive billionaire to uh, investigate a series of lake monster sightings in Minnesota, which he knows from the outset have to be complete crap, but he hates his job as a cruise ship doctor so much that he takes the assignment anyway. Uh, and it, you know, it just, it gets out of control. But, but you do a good job with the out of control part. I like, the, yeah. that's my favorite part. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how much do you, plot out something like that when, you, when you're getting started? Uh, I am a huge plotter. Okay. Um, I, I, sort of, I guess I think of it as sort of a sum zero game where mm -hmm. uh, it's nice to be able to be as creative as possible on the page without having to worry uh, about the pacing right. of the story. Uh, Harry Whittington, whom I love and who was once the best-selling novelist in the U.S., which is a little memento mori there, because like good luck finding him now. Right. Uh, once said he would sooner build a house without blueprints than a novel without an outline. <laughs> and I, I agree. Yeah. Um, do but do the stories take off on their own? Or do, I mean, like do you? Do, oh, they do always you know, do. I yeah. mean, it always it always sort of squirms under your heel. Right. Um, what was there any? one book or series of books that you read anywhere along the line when you were growing up where you thought, I want to do that? Yes. I mean, it started with The Godfather. James Elroy certainly had that effect on me. Mm -hmm. Elroy was so real. I read him when I was, I read Black Dahlia when I was 15, mm -hmm. and I thought it was like the most evil book I had ever read. Um, I, and, you know, I was like, I, I, you know, you're 15, you're a little superstitious and so forth. Now I think it's sort of pure genius. Right. Um, certainly Jim Thompson, uh, mm -hmm. all of him. Uh, but uh, I read a lot of crime. All right. Were you reading it? I, I'm always interested in how people find out about stuff. I mean, was it stuff that, did you, 
read other writers talking about these people or your friends or teacher? Uh, you know, where, where did it come from? Yeah, and you know, there were, there were groups about that kind of thing. The Strand had a great crime section. My father was really into crime fiction, mm. and it was just around a lot. Right. Um, which was obviously, uh, that's probably the best resource you can have as yeah. a kid. Right. Do you actually know any criminals? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, actually, uh, there is a particular guy uh, on whom the character of, of Pietro Brown is partly based, uh, who was a violent criminal, did a number of years in prison, uh, changed his ways, isn't a physician, but is very close in the, in the healthcare field. Uh, his story uh, wasn't all that interesting to me in the sense that he had a huge religious conversion in prison, hmm. and that was sort of his narrative about why he had changed, right. uh, which I, I suspect is probably far more effective, but I, I wasn't interested in telling that particular story. Right. So how much overlap is there between being a writer and being a doctor? Oh, uh, there's a fair amount. You, I mean, you write a lot as a doctor. Uh, and there's, it's all plotting. Right. I mean, it's all like, why do you have this problem? Right. Uh, how did it begin? Where's right. it going? What am I going to do about it? Right. Um, people, when you're a physician, uh, tell you things they don't tell their best friends. Hmm. Uh, and you get a sort of A to B story. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is sort of like, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing, and it, 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 it's a real privilege to hear that stuff. Uh, but it does teach you to think in a certain way in terms of how do to, how to people's traits come about. Right. There, there, I, I was looking for it today before I came in. I couldn't find it. Um, there's a quote, though, from somewhere from Walker Percy, um, who was obviously a, a doctor who never practiced. Um, and... Percy said that it was that, that that he enjoyed just the habit of mind of being a doctor because he said he thought a novelist's job was to diagnose society but not to prescribe for it. Um, That's interesting. Um, yeah. And um, I don't know, does that ring any bells with you or? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it certainly uh, one has less responsibility for one's fictional characters than one's actual patients. R true. Uh, the insurance is much lower. Right. <laughs> um, you, you, we emailed this afternoon and you had already gotten, like, you know, sort of somebody was after you on the internet for what you said on the Today Show this morning. Do you get a lot of mail from, from angry people or...? I don't get any mail from anybody. Okay. Uh, I, they, they may send it, but I, you, know, I, you know, I live on my sister's couch in Park Slope. And unless they know that, I don't see how they're going to get it to me. Your secret is out, right? Um, Sorry, my sister keeps telling me I, I should say that I live in the top three floors of the Majestic. Uh, it's a lovely apartment. Well, uh, let's open this up. Uh, you know. Um, Please, if anybody has any questions, and we can pass the mic around, or if you have trouble hearing, or... I hear it's that influence your fiction, but especially with wild things, and like there's a lot of you know, pop culture B-movie influences in the story. So, what non-writing influences have you Yeah, right on. That's a good question. I mean, uh, the... the uh, the book, I wouldn't call this necessarily non-writing, but the book has a lot of uh, particularly structural uh, debts to 70s horror novels that used to be available in drugstores only for 75 cents. Uh, I, I used to love those so much. There was always, after Jaws, there was always some creature uh, that was, you know, you had to sort of squint to find threatening uh, that, was, that was eating people who were having sex. And it, it's a genre that I miss uh, very much. Um, I love horror movies. Um, the, the real, uh, the amount, I mean, the, the question of what the role of rationality is in society today uh, is obviously uh, much brought to bear by the current political climate. I mean, I don't, I try not to get too political, but they're saying some crazy shit out there. 
Um, people say things that you would be thought crazy to have said 10 years ago. Uh, and I just find that really interesting. And also, uh, I, I mean, it's, just, it's interesting, like, uh, that we seem to, you know, progress is a, is a word that has been uh, recently sort of much, much criticized, uh, particularly by Ronald Wright in Canada. Uh, this idea that we're moving somehow forward, that things are somehow getting better, uh, versus just like time goes forward and everything's going to hell. Um, but it is funny how belief systems uh, go retrograde as well as anterograde. Does that make any sense? That doesn't make sense. Does it? Sometimes history goes forward, sometimes it goes backwards. Mr. Reinwein, Dr. Reinwein. Uh, Sorry, he was Mr. when I met him. <laughs> you, you said something at the end of the novel about uh, cynicism versus gullibility. Correct. My general sense from the novel is it weighs on the side of cynicism. Do you have anything to say in defense of gullibility? Yeah, it's really fun. It's nice. I mean, it's like, you know, like Karl Marx uh, says that uh, religion is the opium of the people. But then he says, at least uh, in, in the translation that Orwell gives, uh, it is the sigh of the soul in a soulless world, which is, uh, doesn't really make a lot of logical sense. But we all know what that means. I mean, the irrationality is, is probably where our best experiences come from. Uh, it's what lets us sort of get up in the morning. That's violet. Right. <laughs> uh, violet, he said, who's one of the characters. Thanks. And Joe and I used to have this uh, conversation sort of night and day back in the day. Because uh, I was a cynical, cynical child. <laughs> um. I'm in love with Violet, by the way. Oh, thank you. I am too. Uh, well, that's a good question. What's the difference? Reagan Arthur, folks, my editor. <laughs> um. mm. Well, what I keep coming back to as a crime writer is that ignorance just makes people ripe to be fleeced. Uh, that the more uh, you believe in, the easier a target you are, and the more somebody who believes in less will take advantage of you. Uh, that, I think, we would call cynicism. Uh, when they tried to do it to me, I would call it skepticism. Uh, but I'm pretty skeptical and cynical. I wish I weren't. Uh, you know, I was talking again today to the guy from the London Daily Mail, uh, who's a... Uh, because I, I wrote this series last week. I had two days to write four articles, so I wrote about the Loch Ness Monster because I had like a bunch of books about it sitting around. Uh, and this has been taken uh, much more seriously in, say, Scotland than I ever expected it to be. Uh, and this guy keeps calling me back uh, from this newspaper, and he's a believer. And he calls me back and he says, okay, now we have to deal with this sighting. What do you say to this sighting? And you know, I would love to believe in the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, I, wanna, I would, in fact, want to go to Loch Ness just to check it out. Although I happen to uh, some, feel somewhere between thinking and knowing that it was invented by a specific person in the 1930s. But it would be great if it was real. The question is whether you can afford to hope or even have false beliefs. And I think that gets rougher as, as times get rougher. Yes, uh, incidentally, uh, Dr. Juan Oliver, uh, my nephrology preceptor from medical school, um, the question was, uh, does the character get more cynical as he gets older? Uh, the answer is yes. I like, I, the character is designed to be a sucker uh, at least a few more times. Uh, he's somebody who's supposed to uh, think he's utterly cynical, 
but uh, nonetheless finds himself in, in situations where he learns that things are far worse than he expected. And that's, you know, that's sort of what I do to that guy. Yes, please. Uh, my, my sister, Stephanie, folks, any chance that he'll face a serial killer? Uh, what my issue with serial killers is I don't, I mean, statistically, I don't really believe in them. Um, I mean, they do exist, and as you know, I read about them constantly. Uh, but the idea, I mean, now, you know, we're in such a, again, just to such a cynical age. I mean, I don't know who read the New Yorker article about profiling and how it doesn't work. I mean, it's just, how do you catch a serial killer except that they screw up in some obvious way or really want to be caught? You know what? That, that actually is a very optimistic thing. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows the horrific case of the serial killer Albert Fish, uh, who was just a horrifying set of murders. When he was finally arrested, which was a very clever job on the part of the police, they analyzed some paper that he had stolen from a hotel to write a disgusting note to one of the parents of uh, the children that he killed and ate. He said when he was arrested that he had a bunch of nails in his perineum that he had placed there, that he liked to hammer them in himself. He was disbelieved. Uh, clearly, he was a fairly crazy gentleman, but the x-ray that they then gave him is one of the most famous x-rays in radiology. He was doing it. And what I love about that story is that it implies that at some level, he knew how awful he was uh, and felt the need to punish himself. So uh, to me, that's a very hopeful and optimistic story. <laughs> love sea monsters. Um, I think the hard part about writing about things you know is that you don't know what you know, you don't know what you don't know. I was very lucky to, in that sense to go to medical school when I was old because I realized at all times how bizarre it was. Uh, I think if you just go straight through, you start seeing things as normal that really are not normal experiences. Uh, you know, like delivering a baby or doing an autopsy or whatever. Um, so I think it really is, I think people have the hardest time writing about things they're very familiar with. But that's just a guess. Uh, Sir. Well, uh, I don't have a real person in the novel. You don't have to be concerned that <laughs> this person should be released. Um, in fact, it reminds that, that that question, uh, David Hockney used to give a lecture where he would show this book on Japanese art that had a painting of Mount Fuji. And next to it, it had this black and white picture and it said, the real Mount Fuji. Um, I do use an actual person as the basis for a character whom I then name after that actual person. Uh, I did what diligence I could in terms of reading all the biographies and the autobiography and so forth. Uh, but this in particular is somebody who, uh, very hard to know, very few public pronouncements that aren't scripted, that kind of thing. Uh, and I would never pretend that it somehow is what this person uh, is actually like, because I have no idea. At the back. How often when you're writing, shock, surprise, and horrify yourself as, as a writer, how do you respond to that shock, surprise, and I think any emotion that you can feel while you're writing is something to go toward. Um, I mean, that only really happened once with this book. I wrote this section, uh, really, that was meant to just be a bargaining chip with my editor. Uh, I thought that she would remove it. Uh, she didn't remove it. Um, I'd forgotten about it. Uh, I went back and reread it. I was like, well, that's, that's surprising. Any others? No? 
I, I have one more. Sure. I, I, I mean, I, I want to. This is not really a question, but it, exactly. But I'm. I was fascinated by the. I mean, when you planned the second book, mm. did you go into it with the idea that I'm going to footnote this? I'm going to have an appendix to this. I mean, was all that apparatus in your mind? It was. So many people complained about the footnotes in the first book that I felt like I had to put them in the second book. <laughs> um. I mean, I have pretty strict criteria for footnotes. They have to add nothing to the plot. Um, and it, they have to be things that if you just put them in the text, it would make no difference, right. except it would be a lot easier to read on an e-book. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen the way it looks on an e-book. Um, but there, beyond just the technicalities of it, um, uh, it, it, it kept striking me over and over that this is very entertaining. I was just completely absorbed with what you were saying, how you were saying, and I kept thinking that, like, you know, people always talk about they don't want to be preached at in novels mm -hmm. and things like that, and, and there was a sense that I was being preached at, and I really wasn't minding it a bit. Now, maybe a lot of that had to do with the fact that I agreed with your point of view, um, but that it was, you know, it was really messing with the form. I mean, this is, I mean, we kind of got into this earlier, but I mean, I, I don't think too much can be made of this. I mean, I think that's, that's really something you're, you know, you're, you're doing something very striking there. I am definitely pretentious enough to feel like I have to reinvent the novel every time I write okay. one. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, I don't, I, that may not be such a great uh, commercial instinct, but uh, seriously, I don't, I don't get to write them that often. Right. I love doing it. If I'm going to do it, it's going to be somewhat experimental. I try to be as entertaining as possible, particularly when being experimental, uh, because I personally, I mean, you know, like, I don't know if anybody's read The Erasers by Robe Grier. By Robe Grier. It's the least interesting crime novel ever written. It's very experimental. The, the third person narrator turns out to be the killer. Oh, I gave it away. <laughs> you never would have gotten there anyway. I think that's true. Well, I mean, I always feel like, you know, why do something somebody's already done? You know, uh, uh, you know. Right, I mean, except that people clearly love that. Um, yeah, I yeah. mean, they, they, there is a, a tremendous, uh, it, you know, it, it is series novels that do well, right? Uh, not just in crime fiction, but now in oh, yeah. in a lot of genres. Uh, and uh, you know, the question is really what what is a series novel? Like, uh, I, I'm a big I read all of those. Uh, who's the guy on the houseboat? The busted flush. John D. McDonald. Well, John uh, D. McDonald, Travis right? McGee, Travis McGee, right? And uh, Travis McGee doesn't really age in those novels. Uh, and in fact, they stopped putting. Uh, John D. McDonald's photo on the back of them and replaced it with a painting of the character because the series had gone on for so long. Right. Um, and there's something to be said for that. The guy never ages. I, it's not, uh, he seems to have an amazing adventure every three days. Right. Um, and I, I certainly don't knock that. I've read a lot of those kind of books. Right. We have a hand there. D uh, Dan Krokos, author. Uh, it's the discussion about Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Didn't think for a second that would be in the book. <laughs> um, not, I'm, not, I'm not unhappy that it's in the book. But uh, yeah, didn't think it would be. Anybody else? You were asked this morning why you put Sarah Palin in. Well, I'm super sad. So uh, I wanted to ask, why did you respond? Mm. And why did you respond? Why did I respond about Rick Santorum instead? I was just trying to make a generic point about how batshit Republicans were. I was trying to distract people from the fact that Sarah Palin had just been mentioned, so that they maybe wouldn't realize she was in the book. Uh, and uh, you know, for me, I mean, like I say, Sarah Palin is not in the book. Um, there is a character who looks like her, acts like I was sort of imagining she c might possibly ask. But, you know, since you've said that, the big question with these people, because uh, the, the book is about irrational assholes, and I needed some to talk about. And the question with these people always is, 
are they sincere? Do they really believe that climate change is a hoax? Or are they just saying that because they get some sort of percentage doing so that they think will allow their offspring to live like another two years longer than the rest of our offspring? Um, and I really don't know. There's no way of knowing. Um, what I liked about Palin is that, uh, and I talk about this a bit in the sources section, there's some indication that maybe she really believes some crazy shit. Um, and that made her very sympathetic to me in a way that a lot of these people, like John Beaner, not sympathetic to me. That guy, I think, is just a flat out creep. I think there's no way he doesn't, I, I just think there's no way he believes in the things that he routinely says. Uh, Sarah Palin has a history of tremendous corruption, particularly as uh, mayor of Wasilla, uh, during which time the uh, local debt went from 1 million to 24 million. Most of it went to a company that happened to buy her a house. Um, she probably uh, was engaged in some shenanigans uh, as governor since she quit after 18 months rather than face various uh, ethics violation accusations. Uh, I don't really know. But then again, she really did get prayed over by the, w by the guy who ca was casting out the witches um, and who wished great money on her. I, I actually cite the video in the sources section. Uh, so she was actually the one I could stand to talk about. I mean, Rick Santorum is disgusting. Do you think there's any meaning to the fact that Rick Santorum won the Republican primary in Minnesota? Right? Not a coincidence. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, Minnesota's a weird place. I think I mentioned in the book, Bob Dylan's from there, and so is Michelle Bachman. And so is, uh, what's his name, the guy who was on Saturday Night Live? Prince. And Prince. You're like, how do you fit Prince into that? I really don't know. Um, but the idea that Rick Santorum might run into Prince and I won't seems really unfair because I think one of us would appreciate it a lot more than the other one. Neither one would know the other one. I think it's probably pretty safe to say. Maybe. I mean, you know, they could run into each other at church, I suppose. Um, Not the same church. <laughs> I had a question now, I forgot it. Um, yes, please, Jeff. Um, you have amazing opening lines and opening sections. When you talk about flying the book, do you come upon the moment where you realize this is a great line and has to go first, and that scene tend to go first in the line? I'm just wondering, they're so memorable as kind of openers. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, it's. I always feel like the beginning of the book is a weird paradox. It's the most important part of the book, but it's the part that you're going to rewrite the maximum number of times. So in some senses, any one time you're writing it, it's the least important part. And uh, yeah, I think good things tend to come out of that, just constant working at it. Thanks. I wonder if there's part pleasure and part shock in words of yours becoming immensely popular. Becoming? Immensely popular. Made by uh, uh, the, re the response for you, for instance, the first book, the second book. Of what, what hits you? you? You're writing something in the privacy of your own room. It it goes into the world, and there's response to it. How does that strike you? It yeah, it's very strange. Equal parts pleasure, and equal parts. Bless you. Um, yeah, it's very strange. I mean, I I like to think that I write uh, essentially for a demographic identical to myself um, with just a few explanations and guideposts thrown in in case you just you didn't happen to read the issue of science that I was just reading. Um, it, so it's amazing to me that anybody cares. It really is. I mean, it's, it's awesome. Anyway, we should, oh, sorry, one more. That's my agent, Marcus Hoffman. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I, the, I've, as you probably alone in this room know, I've written, this book was at times much, much, much longer. And pretty much every character in it was somebody I wanted to write about at great length. Uh, and I often did, and Marcus was kind enough to read that. Uh, but nobody else would have sat still for it. But uh, almost everybody, uh, I've got just reams of paper about. 
Uh, so actually, I, I felt the need to make them interesting, at least to me. Thanks. No, I think we move on to the sign and wine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming.